All right, guys, go ahead and take your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians. Uh, we're going to start 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, in just a few minutes. Um, this, this concept of multiplication, um, and I don't know how much new I'm bringing to it. I, I guess I should have looked at it from a millennial point of view. Um, but really, we're going to read a lot of text this morning. It's not going to be a typical message for me. Normally, uh, here we just take a couple of verses and kind of expand on that and what God is saying in his word. But we're going to take a lot of text and just see what God's word has to say and just let that and his spirit and his words kind of flow over us uh, this morning and see what he has to say about multiplication. Because really I'm focusing more on the multiplication at the level of the gospel and its effect on our heart. And I think if we focus on the gospel and what Christ is doing in us, multiplication will be a process that just occurs through us. Uh, it's not something where we're going to need to trick people into it. We're not going to have programs. We don't have to do anything uh, out of the ordinary to get people who love Jesus and understand what Jesus has done for them and that he is working through them. And it's not their sufficiency that takes the gospel to the nations, but it's his sufficiency that through you that takes the gospel to the nations and that he has saved you from death to life. And when we understand that and we get excited about it and passion overflows, then multiplication occurs. And so this morning, I just want us to see what Scripture has to say about what Christ has done in us. And I think that will challenge us to allow God to work through us. Uh, and so at the heart, I think Scripture will tell us of every single believer is multiplication. And I know that multiplication isn't something that we typically talk about in the church, or uh, it even sounds like maybe a program that we might have, but I think, as I said, when we understand the truth of Christ, the DNA of our lives is to proclaim the gospel fearlessly, uh, regardless of the cost, because there's an understanding that Jesus is worth it, that there's an understanding that the gospel is all that we are. There's an understanding that he is everything. And so without him, I have nothing. But with him, I have everything. And this understanding drives our very heart and our very soul and our very minds to have an identity that multiplies what Christ has done in us into the lives of others. And so this whole idea of multiplication comes up. And, and I don't believe, again, that it's something that we really tend to focus on, although it is an implication of the gospel at its core. And so this morning, we're not going to look at it, as I said, from kind of a church program type of thing. And I think that's even how I tended when I was like, okay, multiplication is the topic. What kind of challenge, big challenge can we have at the end? How can we each one reach one? And so next year we're double in size and do all of these different kinds of things that we tend to focus on in multiplication. And not that those things are wrong, but I want to kind of get at the root of multiplication. The organic gospel that's just a seed that's planted in the heart of every believer to produce and multiply what has been produced in it as the spirit waters our souls and our minds and our hearts to a deeper understanding of who he is to a further grasping of the gospel in our hearts and who Jesus is that we were dead in our sin that we were separated from God and what that means is, and I know we talk about that in here every single week, but I want us to kind of understand, and sometimes I just have to take my own heart back to what does the gospel actually mean, because even in my sharing of it, it just becomes kind of routine. But what it means is that I was created to live in a certain way with God. And in that community with him, I was created to do certain things, and in those certain things, I was completely satisfied joy overflowing, everything I did I knew purpose of, and everything that I did was to praise God and to give glory to God, to put his name above all other names. It was for his name's sake that we did all things, and in that community we were perfectly satisfied. But because of our desire to have everything that we can only have in God, in and of ourselves, we sinned against God by putting something above him, mainly ourselves. And because of that, we're separated from the community that we were created to have in God. And therefore, the satisfaction that we have in that community and in that mission that he gives us, which is the multiplication of the gospel, which we'll see in just a second, we lost all of that. And now we're wandering. And now we're alone. And now we're searching. And now we are lost and we're blind to the truth. 
and Jesus and his great love comes and he lives the perfect life on our behalf that we couldn't live. He dies on a cross for our sin. He raises from the grave to overcome that sin and death so that by faith in him, we would be restored back into community because he lived the life we should have lived. He chose the father rather than himself. His will be done, not his own. And so in his dying on the cross and in his rising from the grave, we now can be set free as we'll see in our text. We now have community with him. Now we can be on mission. We can have right relationships with him and with one another, and we desire the multiplication of what we have had birth in our hearts by grace through the power and the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And that type of multiplication is what we're talking about. This is the type of multiplication of the gospel that took place in the early church when it went from a few men in an upper room to all of Jerusalem. And then through persecution and trials and sufferings, the the believers scattered and took it beyond Jerusalem and and began planting gospel seed everywhere that they went. And we began to see gospel multiplication happening everywhere in the form of churches sprouting up. And there was one church in particular, the church of Antioch, that was planted, that became kind of the epicenter of church planting and missions work in the New Testament and in the early church times. And the scripture tells us, and I love this, you can look at it in the book of Acts, that it was just planted by some guys. Nobody of stature, nobody nobody that came from a mega church, nobody that had anyone looking at them saying, those guys, that guy will go out and plant the church that is the epicenter of all missions and church planting in the early church. It was just some guys. And I think it's even cooler that maybe even Paul, in some sense, kind of indirectly kind of planted the church in Antioch because it was his persecution and oversight of the stoning of Stephen that sent people and things like that scattered out of Jerusalem to, to plant gospel seeds as they were going. They didn't stop proclaiming. They were just moving from persecution. All the disciples stayed in Jerusalem. Everybody else went out, and the church in Antioch was planted. And then later they would actually send out Paul on his missionary journeys. And so what we have is the church itself, this entity that is the only entity on planet earth that is never ending, it's eternal, and it's the only thing we can pour ourselves into and leverage all that we have to see multiplied and built, and it is the only thing that will last for eternity. Multiplication is at its core. As Peter calls the living stones that build that church body up, those, us, we only come into the gospel and its truth through the multiplication of the gospel through the word of God and other believers sharing it. Multiplication has always been the way that God works on planet earth. In fact, if you go all the way back to Genesis in the garden in Genesis 1.28, God tells Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. And this is not a college pastor turning this into a sex sermon, because what we see theologically, is that okay for me to say? Nobody laughed. Um, <laughs> see, college students, we're okay with talking about that stuff. In church, it's not that big of a, you know, thing. Um, and so... Um, What we're seeing there theologically is that God is saying, you have community with me as you were created to have community with me. You have right relationship with one another as you were created to have right relationship with other. I give dominion to you over all the earth. Go and multiply, be fruitful, and fill the earth. And what he's saying there is fill the earth with worshipers and glorifiers and people who give all thanks and all praise to me. Fill the earth with those who will be satisfied in me. Go and multiply. This command is also given again after the flood, after sin enters into the world. In Genesis 9, 1, it's given to Noah. And so I would challenge you this morning when you see a rainbow outside, don't just let it remind you that God will never flood the earth again, but let it remind you that there was a command that came in Genesis 1, 28, and there was a command that came in Genesis 9, 1, and there's a command for us today, be fruitful and multiply those who are satisfied in the gospel and in Christ alone. When Jesus comes to earth, he even bookends his ministry with this same command. He calls the first disciples in Matthew 4, 18 through 22, and he tells them to to lay down your nets, lay down your livelihood, 
Lay down what brings all things that you believe you need on this earth and follow me. And he says, I will make you fishers of men. And at the end of that same gospel, as Jesus has already died on the cross and risen from the grave, he stands before the disciples and he gives them one last command, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. We call it the Great Commission, the mission that every single one of us are to be on, to go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he promises that he will be with us always. He's living and dwelling in us. And as he's living and dwelling in us, his mission becomes our mission. He's saying, continue what I have begun. Disciples are to image who they are discipling. In this day, if you were a disciple of a rabbi, you would follow that rabbi and essentially you would image him perfectly and become him. And when that rabbi would pass, then that disciple would just come in as in the rabbi's place and be essentially that rabbi. He would work as that rabbi worked. He would do what that rabbi did. He would have relationships that that rabbi had, those people that that rabbi had relationships with. This is why in the beginning, and it was used essentially as a derogatory term at the beginning, that we were actually called Christians, or little Christ, or Christ-like. That in the very name that we carry to represent our faith, it's revealing that we are to be multipliers of the work of Christ that he has done in us, that we might be a people who came to save sinners. For the believer, multiplication is at its very our very identity. Um, It's amazing to me. I'll share this with you, and then we'll read this text together. Um, Rachel and I, we just had our third baby. Um, And uh, in that, I kind of learned something new with each one of them, and um, they're hard lessons every single time. And so I'm praying to God that this is our last lesson, and this is our, maybe our last child. I don't know. Um, uh, But that's become increasing every night in my prayers. But um, with this one, okay, Uh, Judah was born, and it's incredible to me the things that babies just do. There's basics to life that they just know. And then there's obviously a lot of things they have no clue about, and they're helpless, and they need lots of help and lots of learning. And and beyond the just they know how to eat, and they know how to sleep, and they know um, how to do all those other little things that they just kind of come out of the wounds breathing and doing everything that they just naturally do for the basics of life. There's something that they do that I realized this time. And that's that one of the basics of their life is actually that they know how to communicate. They understand that I need to reveal the desires within me to get the needs that I have. And so crying is a natural thing that a baby does. It was incredible to me, and it is incredible to me, that all of these things kind of happened, and that I was kind of sitting there, and he was crying, and I was beginning to realize that. And then, of course, everything else, he's completely helpless and needs everything for Rachel and I to help and to train him up. But there's these basics there that he just does. And then I began to think, this is like salvation. Scripture likens salvation to being born again. And so there's something in the hearts of the believers that we just basically begin to do as salvation occurs in our hearts and we are saved and we are redeemed and we are made new. There's things that just start happening and multiplication is one of the things that naturally happens at the birth of the believer, I believe that we see in Scripture. It's an instinctual communication of a need. That community with God is just driven through us and out of us in a natural language so that as soon as we feel life, we begin to express it. C.S. Lewis said, what we find satisfaction in isn't fully satisfying unless we express it. This is why so oftentimes when we see something beautiful, like the words kind of come out of our mouth as though we cannot hold them back. That's beautiful. When we stand at something that brings us awe, maybe like a Grand Canyon or a mountain or an ocean, and we look and we're just in awe, there's something in us that just says, wow. And that communication of what is happening in us is actually a completion of the feeling. And so it's as if God has made us in this way, that in community with him, and and then even in our lost community, whatever we're finding satisfaction in, we must proclaim it for it to be fully satisfying for us. 
All things in this world, though, we begin to find satisfaction in, and for a moment it satisfies, for a moment we preach it, but then it no longer works, and we continue having to search for other things. But in Christ, there's this satisfaction that happens that is eternal because he is eternal, and what he does in us is make us new, and what he does in us is re-commune us with God as we were created to be, and in that we will never, listen, never be fully satisfied satisfied with God unless we are communicating what he's done in our hearts. It completes the satisfaction. He's created us to know him, but he's created us to praise him. And if that's not there on a personal level, and that's not there on a church-wide level as the body then we have major problems because the gospel is not being completed in us. We won't see multiplication in our communities. And so look with me, 2 Corinthians, starting in chapter 2, verse 14, and we're just going to read this together. I'm only going to interject when I feel like it would be necessary for me to bring clarity. But 2 Corinthians, chapter 2, starting in verse 14, says this, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. So we're already seeing that this is just something that occurs when the gospel takes grip of our hearts, when we understand what Christ has done for us and who Christ is producing us to be, right? All of the Christian life is us becoming who God has already declared us to be in Christ, right? And so as we're becoming more holy, as we're becoming more like Christ, then we find ourselves as a fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Not maybe, it is so. Verse 15, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To another, a fragrance of life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity is commissioned by God and the sight of God to speak in Christ. There's the command. Chapter 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are a letter of recommendation written on your hearts to be known and to be read by all. So this word and this knowledge of the fact that we are to be an aroma and a fragrance of God everywhere, that this is what God is doing in us when the gospel has saved us and when Christ is dwelling within us, the Spirit is working through us. We are a fragrance. We are an aroma. And it is not something that is just written in stone anymore. It's something that's written on our hearts. It becomes who we are, not who we're aspiring to be anymore. It's our identity. It's like a book that you have, and and that book gives you uh, uh, materials and truths and things that are to be learned. And, And God is saying, look, this is not just a book. These are not just some words, but this is something that is living within you. It's in your heart. It's written upon you. You are the way of communicating what I do in the life of a person who is lost in their sin and how I save them and bring them from that sin. Verse 3, And so you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Again, the word is living. The word is active. It's alive and working in you. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God. I love this part, verse 5. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. And and so already when we start talking about multiplication and we are in Christ to be a fragrance and aroma everywhere that we go, this is the command. And it's written on our hearts to be lived out through us into the world that everyone may know who Christ is and what Christ has done and how he saves. We are the living and active portion of what Christ is doing. He says here, 
Don't fear. Don't curl back. Don't be afraid that this is the command, and don't be afraid that you are an aroma because it's not on your sufficiency that this will be accomplished. You are an aroma. You are a living and active word of God if Christ is in you, but you are not sufficient, he says. But God is sufficient through you. And I love that because it means that everything God is calling us to do, he's not calling me to do it on my own behalf and with my own power and through my own ability. He's calling me to surrender to the work that Christ has already done. He says, I am sufficient. There's no fear in this call. Verse 6, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of this new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives. He's talking about the law there. Verse 7, now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. So the law was out there. It was being brought to an end because the grace of Christ was coming. He was coming to die. He was coming to be a sacrifice. We would no longer be judged under the law, but Christ would be judged under the law on our behalf so that in him, by our faith alone and his grace upon us by doing all the work and him being sufficient for the entire call and for our salvation, we have life. Look at verse 11. For if anyone, for if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more what is permanent will have glory. Verse 12, since we have this hope, since we have this hope, since we have the gospel in us, since the sufficiency for this work being done in us and through us is on God and his work, not our work. This is the hope that we have of a future glory, not depending on my doings and accomplishments, but his accomplishment that's already done and a promise that we will one day be with him for all of eternity, that hope. Because we have that hope, he says, we are very bold. Not, not that in Christ there's boldness out there. Not, not that in Christ we can kind of hope that we can be bold in certain situations and, and, and we just need to seek out boldness. And certainly if it isn't there, then we can pray and ask God for all things and he will give us all things needed to fulfill his mission and give him glory, do his name. But he says right here, when we understand that hope, we are very bold. Verse 13, not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened for to this day when they read of the Old Testament covenant, the same veil remains unlifted. And I, and I love this because this is true for us as well when we seek satisfaction and life in the world and not in Christ. We're constantly striving after different things. We're constantly chasing after things that might give us everything that we're longing for and everything that we're desiring. And make no mistake, every single one of us in this room has desires and longings that we are wondering, will this be fulfilled? And in those longings and, de and desirings outside of Christ, that is sin in our life that's covering a veil over us from seeing the truth and living in the truth. And no matter what we chase, no matter what we seek satisfaction in, no matter what we are after in this life and what might give us a little bit of joy, it will not last. And there will be a veil over your face that will keep you from the truth. And it will lead to death, not life, as Paul says here because, second part of verse 14, only through Christ is the veil taken away. Only in Jesus is life made known to us. Only in what he has accomplished do we have all that we desire and all that we long for already within us. He says, yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. 
And I get this picture of when Jesus died on the cross and when he was hanging there and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then a little while later he said, it is finished. Sin is paid for. They can be made new. Community can be had. It is done. And in the temple, there was a veil that covered the place of the Holy of Holies from the people. And that veil, when he said, it is finished, was torn in two. We now can have relationship and community as we were created to have relationship and community with the God who created us to be satisfied and joy-filled in him. Only through Christ is that veil removed. Verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, behold the glory of God. Now we see him for all that he is. Now we see that he's worthy of our thanksgiving and our praise. Now we understand that he's the only one that we were created to give all of ourselves to and that we should leverage everything to his glory and to his honor and to his praise. When the spirit is at work in us and the gospel is taking root and the spirit is watering our souls, what is planted and what springs forth is, only to you I live. You are life and you are everything and everything is from you and to you and all that I do is to you and for you and I will live out my life that others may know that you are the only one that will take the veil that has blinded them and cause them to live for all sorts of good or bad things and that you satisfy the soul of every man through the cross and the resurrection and you are sufficient. And then it says he's transforming us into the same image. This image that we might reflect who he is and all that he is and all that he's done and all that we do to one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And let me stop right there just for a moment because I want us to take a moment to reflect on what this freedom is. It says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And, and I know that so oftentimes in my own life, and I, and I have this habit of mine, that whatever I'm going through, I believe others are going through too, because I'm a human being, and I think if I have a struggle, others probably have the struggle too. And so I try to reflect on these things and where I struggle, and I know for me, multiplication is not a thing that comes natural. It's a thing that only comes when I'm understanding the gospel in my heart, and it just begins to flow from me as some Something that I just cannot stop. But in my natural self, it scares the mess out of me to know multiplication of the gospel and what Christ is doing in my life is my command. I don't see it as what Paul is about to describe the way we should see it when we understand who Christ is. I cling to the truth of what Jesus has done. What? Jesus saves me. Jesus died for me. It's by grace that I'm saved. I'm no longer under the law, but I'm under grace. He's working in me. He's doing these things. I'm promised a future and a hope. I'll be with him for all of eternity. How glorious heaven must be one day. I'm down with all of that stuff until I discover that what the gospel does is not just allow me to sit and enjoy, but that what the gospel does is plant seeds in us that we desire and long to see planted all throughout a lost and dying world because we have been given life. And it says, even here as Paul is writing 2 Corinthians, that we are a light shining into a dark place but there's a lot of fear there for me when I don't understand it. I don't desire to go out and just share all that Christ has done in me and multiply the gospel out as it has been designed to. And so what does this freedom mean? It's a word that we often use, but I don't know if we truly grasp what gospel freedom is in our hearts. And I think the first place that we would go is to say, okay, that this freedom, the Spirit of the Lord, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, is freedom. That means that we're free from our sin. 
And that's true, but on this deeper level, it means that we're free from what sin does to us. And this is where the rubber really hits the mode with, road with our mission, because if I'm free from what sin does to me, then I'm free from the separation that I was separated in Christ in my sin from. Therefore, there's no longer anything separating me from him. I have community with him. Sin is not having dominion over me. Sin is not ruling over me, but now Christ is ruling over me. And that makes a big difference in how I live my life. I'm saved from the effects of sin, yes. I'm going to heaven when I die, yes. But I'm saved from living in sin now. I'm saved from being under the dominion of sin now. It's shame no longer has a hold on me. It's guilt no longer has a place in me. Fear and anxiety are no more in Christ. How? Because in Christ, we have everything that we need to be all that we have created to be and all that we have ever longed for or desired in him and in him alone. Sin no longer separates. It no longer gets in our way. It no longer has dominion. We no longer have fear because I don't have any needs outside of him who is everything and in him I have all things I need to have everything I'm created for and long for in my life and so you can't take anything from me that will take anything of who I am that gives me the identity that I live on and the identity I find satisfaction in and the identity that I find joy in so where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, whom shall I fear? And what should I fear leaving? What anxiety should I have? What sin should weigh me down when he has nailed it to the cross? Because in his blood I've been completely washed as white as snow. There's freedom here. There's also freedom to live as we have been called to live. There's freedom to love selflessly as he has loved us selflessly because I don't need things from other people to complete who I am. Christ completes who I am. Therefore, I can love because Christ has loved me. I don't have to love because you are loving me or I'm experiencing love from some other way. I can forgive. Bitterness has no place in me now. I've been forgiven of much. I've been forgiven of any more than I could ever have to forgive anyone else. But also, no matter who wrongs me, they cannot take anything away from me that would take away my identity and my satisfaction because that is in Christ and Christ alone. Bitterness has no place. Forgiveness can be something we are free to do. So church, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom that frees us to live in him, it frees us to image him, to lay down our nets, our livelihood, and what we find everything in that, that we think we need all that we need in, and everything that we feel like if I lost this, I could not go on, I would not have life, whatever that is, we can lay it down and be fishers of men. We can feel with all sincerity, I must decrease that he might increase. I can lay down my life and live as Christ, as Paul proclaims. And that allows us to be on the mission that matters most, to build the church that is the only entity that will last for all of eternity. And in that hope of that freedom, verse 12, we are bold. We understand our mission. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, do we not, we do not lose heart. Um, I said just a second ago that I, for myself, and I just assume this for others, have um, a, a lot of hope in and a lot of security in what 
the gospel does for us on a personal level and what it does with our sin, but then we have kind of this almost distaste or dislike or fear of the mission that salvation comes with. But Paul says right here, this mission is actually a mercy. That it's not a duty. It's not a chore. It's not God saying, I will save you, but then you have to do this for me. It's not the underbelly of our salvation, so to speak. He says it's a mercy to us that we don't even deserve this mission. And if we didn't have it, then we would be about the mission of the world. We would have a veil over our eyes. We would be a people who are seeking everything that we long for in other things. And we would be chasing after all of those things and not him. And that would lead us to bondage, not freedom. That would lead us to preaching a message that leads to bondage and not freedom because as we find life in other things, we multiply what we find life in into those around us. And so not only are we not living in the freedom of the gospel, but we are not producing the freedom of the gospel. And so Paul is saying, if we are in Jesus, the, this mission that he gives us actually displays that our heart understands the freedom that the gospel gives us. And if we're not on this mission with him, and we're not seeking to multiply all that he has done in us, then we are saying with our hearts, I do not understand the freedom that I have in salvation. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for taking me to heaven one day, but I will just do my own thing here on earth. We're missing the gospel. So think for a moment as we begin to wrap things up around this text this morning, where do you find life? What is it that you're living for? Is it under the freedom of the gospel and freeing in your life, or is it putting you into bondage to something that is not eternal? Is it everlasting and worth all that you have and leveraging everything you have to see it multiplied? Or is it something that is not eternal and will fade away? And I want to challenge us on this and ask us a couple of questions because I deal with this constantly in my own life. And in talking with others, we so often have the tendency, our hearts are prone to wonder and so we have this tendency to find life in other things, even in an understanding that Christ is the only place there is life. And so let me ask these things to you. Where do you find life? Is maybe it in your free time? Do we live for the weekend, so to speak, and the days and the mornings that we can just wake up and do whatever it is that we desire to do and think in that moment, this is where life is all about. This is where I find my hope. This is where I have my freedom. This is where... I sit back and think, this is the life. Is it in maybe going to the beach and sitting under an umbrella and watching the waves and hearing the waves come in and feeling the wind against our skin and the sand between our toes? Do we sit there and think, this is what it's all about, and one day this is all I will do? Is it our friends and our relationships that we find everything in, our position at work, our grades at school, our times of vacation, our little houses and our American dreams, the bag full of new clothes that we leave the mall with. All of these are different moments in our lives that we will have a tendency to say, this is where it's at. This is where I find life. And many of those things will be good things when done in the right way and point us to the right one. But when we find life in them, it's a false mission and it will lead to false multiplication to those around us. We can lose them. They're not going to actually satisfy us. They're not eternal. They will cause anxiety in us. How many of you guys um, have ever gotten a new car? and ha were way more anxious about the new car than you were the old car. Like the old car, you would pull into the mall, and you're looking for closest spot. You don't care if it's a motorcycle spot. You're fitting in, right? Like, it doesn't matter. If paint gets on your car, it will actually improve your vehicle. And so you're just like, I don't really care. Um, but when you get the new car, the so-called blessing of a new car, 
Suddenly you're parking way in the back of the mall. You're not even looking to see if there's a closed spot, and you're double parking. <laughs> and we're worried about it the entire time. And this is just on a small scale. Things, when not seen in the proper view, do not free us. They're not blessings to us. They drive us from freedom and from blessing and cause anxiety and fear and things that are not the freedom of the gospel. The things of life will not give us what we desire, but they will cause us to multiply what we find life in in ways that are anti-freedom and anti-truth. And listen, if we live for anything other than Christ as our greatest treasure, then what Scripture says is we don't have him as a treasure at all. We cannot say we love him and not be on the mission he has commended us to. We can't be caught up in finding life in the world. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 is very clear on how that works and how that happened and what we have been saved from and what we have been saved to. And we are called to multiplication. And church, listen. You cannot make disciples of Christ if you worship self You cannot make disciples of Christ if you idolize comfort. You cannot make disciples of Christ if all you long for is privacy. You cannot make disciples of Christ if individualism is your greatest desire. You cannot make disciples of Christ if we just worship the fact that we all have independent truth found in the heart of each individual. We cannot make disciples of Christ if we worship materialism and things here on this earth. And we cannot make disciples of Christ if we think more about our kingdom and the one that we're living in and building than his kingdom and what he has called us to build through him and his power and the work of the Holy Spirit through us. We will never make disciples if our preferences to us are more important than gospel movement that might require uncomfortableness and will require us dying to ourself daily. And listen, I know that these things that I've just said are the characteristics of the culture and society that we live in. But when we buy into these things and we're led to believe and we will be led to believe in those things and in those thoughts and in those worldviews that even in our Christian religiosity that salvation is for us. Thanks for saving me, God. Thanks for all that you do for me. Bless my life as I go. But we will not live for his glory. And we will not live to give him thanksgiving. And we will not live on his mission, but our own. The gospel says, I know that everything on this earth is rubbish considered to knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. So whatever he wants, whatever he's calling, whatever he's doing in me, whether I'm poor or whether I'm rich, it's all to leverage for his glory and his honor and his calling because his calling is a mercy to me. If that was not my calling, I would have a veil over my eyes. Let's close this morning by looking at one more verse. Look at verse 13 of chapter 4. He says this, Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, and then he quotes Psalm 116 verse 10, And the psalmist here says, I believe, and so I spoke. And then Paul adds, we also believe, and so we spoke. Knowing that he has raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may multiply It may increase, your Bible might say, thanksgiving to the glory of God. 
The psalmist here, if you look back at this psalm, Psalm 116, he's going through a lot of suffering and trials and hardships. There's nothing about what he's speaking of gospel truth that's leading him to a further life, that's giving him better wealth, that's giving him better health. In fact, it's costing him what he feels his life. But he makes the proclamation, I believe, so I speak. Back to the fact that multiplication is something that we are birthed with in our very salvation. And Paul says, we also believe, and so we also speak. And so let me close by just asking this question one more time. What do we believe this morning? What is it that we're multiplying? What is it that we're speaking? What is it that we're finding life in? See, Paul says that Christianity is kind of like, if you'll let me do this, a picture or a painting. And we see a picture, let's just say, of a waterfall, and we see that painting of a waterfall and its beauty, and we stand there and we even proclaim, how beautiful is that? But then we walk outside and the very painting of the waterfall, that actual waterfall is there. And we see the actual waterfall and we think to ourselves, wow, how beautiful is that? And suddenly the painting that we saw pales in comparison to the actual waterfall we stand before. Now, we can still admire that waterfall painting, and we can still enjoy the painting for what it is, but forevermore, that painting will only serve to bring memory to us of the glory and the beauty of what was the actual waterfall. And so now, my beach day, now my vacations, now my family, now my friends, they all are glorious and beautiful in their own right, and they do give me some satisfaction and joy, but now I have understood the God of the universe and how I have community with him, and forevermore, this painting will only point to his glory. And there's another thing that happens. I don't know if you guys have ever been around someone who has been somewhere that you haven't been, but you're talking about that place. They're the most annoying people on earth, right? Because they always want to talk about how great the place is and how you should go. Why? Because there's something in them that sees the painting and wants to express, man, you've got to get there. You've just got to see it. This pales in comparison to the satisfaction you can have in the real deal. And the believer's heart knows God. They've seen the true reality. The veil has been lifted through Christ and there is a desire for all to know there's something greater than that painting. There's something more than what you're finding life in. We desire to multiply what Christ has done in us for his praise and for his glory alone. Let's pray. Lord, this morning... God, I just pray that in some way that your spirit has spoken to each person in this room and that you would continue to do so right now. God, there's so much in this text that we've read and, and, and there could be a message on every single verse. But God, let us understand that everything you're doing in us, we're designed to allow you to do through us. Let us be a people who communicate what you have communicated to our hearts. Let us be a people who communicate the life that you have given us into the lives of others. Let us be life-giving. Let us be gospel-multiplying people. And with heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, some of you might be sitting here this morning and, and saying, you know what, Brandon, I, I don't know Christ. I'm not living in him. 
I'm not living on the mission that I'm designed to live on, and I'm not satisfied, and I'm longing, and I'm desiring, but I'm finding it in nothing. Listen, you can have it in Christ. Everything that you desire, everything that you long for, he's the only one that can fulfill it. And so this morning, I'm going to say a quick prayer, and there's no special words to this prayer or magic in this prayer. It's just a simple prayer to lead you so that you can ask Christ to save you, that you can surrender to him. So I'm going to say this out loud, and I just ask that if you desire to surrender to Christ this morning, give your life to him, then you would just say it silently as I pray it out loud. And the prayer goes like this. Dear God, I know that I've sinned against you and I'm separated from you. I know that that separation is what keeps me from having the life in you that you've created me for. God, I thank you that you died on the cross and rose from the grave to overcome that sin. I place all that I am in you. And thank you that you are everything that I need. Use me to multiply this truth. Amen.